Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we thank you, God. We honor you tonight, oh God. We thank you, Father, because you are faithful, God. Yes. As we sang today, God, that there is not even a moment, Lord, that you are never with us and walking with us, God. The Jehovah God, even sometimes when we feel far, Lord, you are still there just waiting for us to turn to you, God. Lord, remind us that. Thank you for reminding us that today, God. Thank you, Jehovah God, for reminding us how much you care for us, God. The Father, you, you have seven billion people, but yet, God, when we need you, God, you are right there with us, oh God. Yes. So personal, so loving, so caring, God. And we are we're just so grateful, God, that even today, God, as we worship you, Lord, as we open our hearts to hear from you, God, we know that you speak to us, God, because you are personal, God. I pray, Father, that as, we, as, as you speak, O King of Glory, that you move me out of the way completely, God, so you can speak to your people, God. I pray for this word, O King of Glory, God, that Jehovah God, it will go deep, Father, and it will be planted in good soil, Lord. Yeah. So Jehovah God, there can be fruits, O God. Let this be a transformational message, O God, not just an informational message, O God. Let it change us, O God. Let, us, let, us, let it draw us near to you, God. Father, at the end of this week, God, we want to say that we've been with you, God, that you, we've been closer to you, God. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So we are continuing with Acts. And so today we're going to look at Acts 23, 11 to 35. And so let's start reading from 11. But the, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified in me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And when it was day, it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat or drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who have formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under the great oath that we will not eat nothing until, they, uh, until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest, that the command, suggest to the commander that he, brought, that, he be, that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you are going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we, we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's son, when Paul's sister's son had this ambush, he went and entered the barrack and told Paul. Then Paul called unto the centurion to him and said, Take these young men to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me, called me, uh, called me to him and asked me to bring these young men to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander looked, took him by hand and went aside and asked privately, What is it that you have what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who bound themselves by the oath that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed him. And now they are ready, they are ready waiting for the, for the promise from you. So the commander let the young men depart and, the commander, com and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And he called the two centurions saying, prepare the 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesar um, at, the, yeah, that name, uh, at the third hour of the night and uh, provide mount to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote the letter in the following manner. Claudius, that name, to the most excellent governor, Felix, greeting. This man was, was, seized, was seized by the Jews and was, was about to be killed by them. Coming with a troop, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before the council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of the law, of their law, but had nothing charged, nothing charged against him, deserving death or chain. And when, and when it was told to me that the Jews lay in wait for the men, I sent him Im immediately to you, and also commanded his accusers to state to state to state, state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him to the night of Atripras. And the next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to Barak. When they had when they had come to that place and had delivered him, they had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he said, 
he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Sicilia, he said, I will hear you, I will hear you when the accusers also come. And he commanded him to keep him in the Herod's Praetorium. <sighs> All right. <laughs> I should have you guys like read this before, right? <laughs> feel like, okay. <laughs> then we can just like, and the reading was done. All right. So, so Paul, and we, we are following up from last time when Pastor Crystal preached. So Paul is in jail and he just got rescued from this mob that was trying to beat him, right? And so now there is a group, there's a group here who 40 assassins, 40 plus assassins, they are, they are finding a way, they are trying to figure out how they're going to kill Paul. And in the process, Paul's nephew, he has the plot and he goes and tells Paul. Then Paul calls the centurion, uh, centurion, and then the centurion goes to the commander and then the commander is like, commands, commands these 200 foot soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to take Paul to the governor. Then on top of that, he goes ahead and sends a letter saying that, yeah, I found Paul. He was, gonna be, he, was, he was almost being killed by these people and he was going to be beaten. But according to what I see, I don't see anything deserving him to be jailed or, or killed. So he, he, he's taken to the governor and the governor is like, okay, well, we'll keep you here in the, in the palace until, until your accusers can come. So it's a... It's an interesting story because we have a guy who's a, who is in prison, who's almost getting beaten by people, but then at the end, he is in the palace just hanging out, even though he has guards. Just an observation, okay. So my first point is this, promised, promised. Acts 23, 11 says, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. As you have testified for me, you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also be a witness in Rome. I love that verse because no matter what was happening, God said, uh, God told Paul, you must. It was not a suggestion. So it didn't matter what else was going to happen. Didn't matter whether there were 40 assassins who were going to try to kill Paul. Didn't matter what they were going to do. Paul was still going to go to Rome because God had said, you must, you, must be, you must be there. And my question today is, do we trust God when he promises something? Because the Bible tells me that God's promises are yes and amen. God says, Paul, you've done well, even though through this persecution. And guess what? You must go to the other place. Paul believed that and he trusted God. And we've seen that that has been his lifestyle. Every time God has said something, regardless of what has happened, Paul has continued to trust God. So even this moment, even though the, um, Paul's nephew comes and says there's 40 assassins who wants to kill you and they have made a, they have made a, um, they have made a pact that they are not going to eat or drink, which means it's pretty serious, right? Do you think he worries or he turns to God because he knows God has done it before for him? See, God's plans will always prevail. God's plans will always prevail. And the thing is, when God tell us, tells us that he's going to do something, and he's laid so many things in the Bible about what he's going to do for those who believe him, his plans will prevail. And the, th- the, the point comes in when sometimes when we know what God is asking us to do, or what God has said, but yet we try to do God's work. Maybe just me. But I try to go in there and I'm like, God, I know you've said this and you've said I'm going to point, you know, I'm coming from here, point A, and I'm going to end up at Z. But then right about M and K, I just start getting worried and I start trying to do my own things, right? (laughs) Just me? (laughs) So this evening, I want to remind you to stop helping God. Stop helping God. Have patience. Have patience because God knows what he's, do, he's doing. And when you look in the Bible, you've seen people that did not have patience, and it caused a lot of things that really didn't go the right way. When you think about Abraham, he was told that he's going to have a son. But then right about there on K and M, then guess what happened? <laughs> he decided that that wasn't the right thing, and God was taking too long. Where did that end Christians and Islam and all those things that happened? Because he tried to help God. Yeah. Then think about how uh, we've been going through the book of, um, we've, been going to, we've been talking about Saul and we've been talking about Paul. We've been talking about Saul and David. Remember when Saul could not wait yeah. and then he sacrificed? 
Okay, you guys haven't, I'll tell, I'll tell Pastor Matt. You guys haven't been listening. <laughs> remember, when, remember when Saul had to wait, did not wait for Samuel to come and do the sacrifice? Yeah. How did that end up? So this evening I'm reminding you to stop helping God and be patient. James 5, 7 is, says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how a farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also must be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is a heart. Establish your heart. Yeah. Wait. You guys have Netflix, you have YouTube. Go and check out farming and see how long. They don't plant the seed and then in the middle of it, like potatoes, they don't plant the potatoes and then two weeks later they dig out to see if the potatoes are working or whether they are growing, right? But don't we do that in our lives though when God tells us to do something? God will plant a seed but then two weeks in, we're in there and we are digging trying to do that. And you know that only messes up the plants, right? Right. Now you guys go home, Mark, for tonight. Go check out YouTube on potato planting. <laughs> and the Bible also tells me that God is not a liar. His word is true. When God says something, when God says, Paul, you must, you must, uh, you must proclaim my name in Rome, he wasn't, making, he wasn't lying. He was still going to provide that opportunity for him to do that. See, God's plans are different from our plans. God's plans are higher than our ways. Think about this. 40, 40 assassins, they've plotted, they, that's what they do. Otherwise, they'll, they'll just be killers. They're assassins. That's their profession, right? So you have over 40 assassins who are plotting how they're going to kill Paul. And so if I told you that, hey, there's these people who are going to kill this man of God, and somewhere, I tell, okay, I don't tell you about what's going to happen, but I tell you, somewhere, somehow, God is going to interrupt their plan. Your mind would be something greater would come in, an angel would come in and wipe them out. Or something great like that. But God's way are different from our plan because he uses a boy to frustrate those plans. And so what that tells me is, when I'm thinking the way God is going to do things, it's probably very different from the way God is going to do things. My way is not trying to figure out how God is going to do things. My way is trying to figure out how do I stay patiently waiting for what God is asking me to do. God used a little boy to frustrate a plan that looked like a foolproof plan. See, he used the boy, a young man, to initiate a powerful response to the devil's plan. God's plans are God's plans, not human plans. Somebody needs to remember that. That God's plan are God's plan. They are not your plan. And they are not your plan for other people either. When you, when you look at people and you are like, well, I know God is doing this, but let me tell you how maybe you should do this. God's plans are God's plans. Let us leave God to be God, right? We are servants. We are children of God. You know, when he tells us to do something, that's what we do. Yeah. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For, the he for as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and any, th any thoughts th uh, than your thoughts. And I've heard this verse and I've read it so many times, and I know you guys have. But then why do we, why are we trying? Why are we trying? Why am I trying to do it in my own way, even though God is saying that my ways are different from your ways and my thoughts are different from your thoughts? There's going to be a lot of questions tonight. <laughs> Don't worry, I asked myself the whole couple of weeks those questions. So I have no mercy. Let's go. <laughs> God's plan, will always try, um, God's plan will always be greater than the enemy's plant, plans. The enemy had a plot, and he thought he had it. He thought he had it. He thought that, hey, guess what? These guys are making a pact. You know, I, I, I think when I read the Bible, the, I try to imagine what happens. Because you think about it. These guys, back in the days when you made a, a, a pact or when you made an oath, he took it very, very seriously. So these dudes, 
They say that they're not going to eat or drink until they kill Paul. Did they kill Paul? So what happened to them? Did they break? <laughs> right? But it shows you the power of God that he didn't even have to kill them. If they did what the old, old times they used to do, they did not eat. They, they caught a cast on themselves. So stop fighting people. Stop fighting war when enemies try to come against you. Stop trying to do it in your own way. Let God avenge you because the battle belongs to God. God says you must bear witness in Rome. Yet God's way are mightier. He uses a small boy to frustrate the plans. And what I love about it is he uses the weak to shame the strong. And the Bible says that. And that's important because sometimes we feel defeated. Sometimes we feel like God cannot use me. Sometimes we feel like the people that do this and this, those are the people that God is going to use. But God looks at your heart and says, can I send you? Are you willing? Is there something in there that I can help you grow? Because sometimes I think we, we label God as this person who's just waiting to smite us if we do something wrong. But when you look at your kids and you see your kid struggling, trying to make something or make it, you know, trying to make something or create something, do you rebuke them or do you go in there and try to help them to build it? That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. He wants to help you regardless of where you are. Luke 24, uh, 6, 7 says, He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful man and be crucified, and the third day he will rise. I love that verse because it says that, Remember how he spoke. He had already told them. The women went out there looking for him, and they are worried. But if only they remembered what Jesus had told them. He said, I will rise up. And all they had to do was remember that part. The enemy created hatred, lies, deception, and fear. Though that when he put Jesus down, that that was the last thing. But what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it around. And it became the greatest win for Christian. Because he is alive. It was the greatest sign of grace and overcoming. So the devil pl plotted that, hey, we're going to crucify him and he's going to be done. The assassin plotted and said, we're going to kill this guy. Right? But God did what he needed to do. And both sides, there was victory because God did it. Do you believe what he has promised will come to be? Do you believe what he has promised will come to be? Five of you. Let's go. My second point is this, trusted, trusted. I love how God works. Of all the people he could have used, he used a little boy to change everything. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is like for those who are like kids in their hearts. Because you tell a kid to go, a child goes. The kid saw danger, he heard danger, and he went and reported and then he was, told by, he was told by the commander, you cannot say anything. And he didn't say anything. Can you be trusted with such information? Is there something God has trusted you with today? Is there something that God has trusted, trusted you today that is going to affect the outcome of your brothers and sisters? Can you keep it in your heart? Can you be trusted to hold on to it? Can God use you in such a situation? Can God use you in such a situation? Or are you self-serving? You have concern of your own welfare and interest before others. Can God use you in such a situation? Or are you self-promoting that even when the commander told the kid that, hey, don't go anything, he goes around the neighborhood saying, let me tell you what I just did. Are you self-promoting? So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have, you have revealed these things to me. Can you be trusted to stay, to stay quiet? Or are you just waiting to be the news originator? Because sometimes it's about life and death. Yeah. Especially in our days with social media, we want to be the first to post. We want to be the first to say something. 
Can God really trust you to hold on to what he's telling you? What if he was trying to save a village? Can he really trust you with that information? Or are we going to be so self-serving, so self-promoting that we cannot wait to get out of the presence of God so then we can tell somebody? Are you, are you self-preserving? You only care about your own safety. This young man was a young, young man. Imagine 40 plus assassins are talking and they're saying, we're going to kill somebody tomorrow. This is a kid right here. And you know kids are scared about everything. But he does not get scared. He does not preserve himself. He doesn't care for his safety because he has to go and tell somebody. What about if you are put in that situation? Would you be like, well, I'm not going to say that because it's going to affect my self-image. I'm not going to say that because it's going to affect how people look at me. I'm not going to say that because it's going to cost me this. I wonder if we can be trusted with such information. Or is it fear? Will fear stop you from being used by God tonight? Are we so scared about everything that we've allowed the enemy to put all these things in our mind that we cannot even do what God is calling us to? Can you be trusted by God? Do you believe that he's able to use you today? Do you believe that he's able to use you today? My third point is urgent. Agency. 23, Act 23, 16, 18. So when Paul's sister's son had the ambush, he went and entered the barrack and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurion to him and said, Take this young man to the, uh, the commander, for he has something to tell. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner called me, uh, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man. He has something to tell you. Then the commander took him by the hand and went aside and asked privately, privately, what is it that you have to tell me? If you note those words, the uh, Paul's nephew, he went. Then Paul called the centurion. So then he took him, then the centurion, the, uh, the centurion took the, the little boy to the commander. Then the commander took him. These are action words. They all acted immediately with urgency. They all acted quickly. They did not wait. The Bible says that 9 p.m. at night is when they gather the army, all those army, to be able to take Paul out of that. Do you have urgency when God tells you to do something? Can you think about it? What would have happened if this boy had waited until the following day? What if even when he went to Paul and Paul said, it's okay, I'll talk to the soldier tomorrow. What if the soldier was told and he's like, Paul, I'm not going to listen to you today. I'm going to wait until tomorrow morning. What if the commander had not called that army until the following day? What would have happened? Let's think about that in our lives. Is there a time in our lives when God calls us to do something but then we are so busy doing our own stuff that we have no urgency to do what God is calling us to do. Has there been a time in your life when you did not act like this little boy? Was there a time in your life when God asked you to say something, to do something, to go and do something, but your, resp your response was different from, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm doing it right now. Do you have an urgency to do the things of God? See, things that are important to God are important to God. Yeah. Yeah. Things that are important to God, they're important to God. And sometimes you don't even understand why, because God is able to do it by himself. But then, just like a dad who's trying to build something, and a, and a kid comes in and is like, Dad, can I help you? And you're like, oh, this is going to take so long, but I love you, so let's do it together. And together, I have my, like, bring, hold, hold this, and, and you teach them something. God has the ability to do it. But we don't take that. We are like, oh, another thing that God is asking me to do. Oh, he's sending me to this place. I got to do my own thing. Yet if we had that picture of God can do it by himself, but then you are the little kid coming in and say, dad, can I help you? 
then we'd have more urgency to do the things God has called us to do. John 9, 4 says, I must work, and the work, I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day and, and day, the, the night is coming when no one can work. We don't know how long we have. Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore you do not know what hour your Lord, of, your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Therefore also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. You know, you guys have heard the story of Kobe Bryant. 41 years old, retired, he was now going to live his life. But no one knows what the time is going to come. I imagine myself getting, I'm 41, so I can identify with that. And it makes me think like, man, time is short because we always think that we're going to live to be 80. But maybe that's not God's plan. Maybe you are, mine, maybe it's 42 or 45, who knows? But the thing is, I'm there and I'm thinking I have all this time to serve God. And I go before God and He says, I gave you this life up to 41. What have you done with it? I called you to serve. I called you to do all these things, but you are always busy with this. Do we have an urgency of why God is calling us? Amen. What if there's never another chance for you to be used? What if there was never another chance for you to be used? Because the thing is, nowadays what happens is we are so quick to point at other people and saying, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you should do this. But we are not reflecting on ourselves knowing that, guess what, maybe that person has another 30 years for God's grace. But you don't have those 30 years. What are you going to do? Do you believe that time is short? See, my title today is, Do You Believe? Because my question is, do you believe these things? Because we come, we read, we th- do these things, and just like social media, when you scroll on a post, and immediately you see someone is moaning, and, oh, I'm so sorry, put a sad face, and then you go in, and there's something funny, you put ha-ha, and within three, within three minutes, you've gone through 50 emotions. We do the same thing with the Bible. Yeah. That we are reading these things, oh, that is so sad, people did that. And then, oh, my goodness, and then the next minute, there is, you don't think about this stuff. Do you believe the stuff you are reading? Do you believe that the Bible is alive? Do you believe that God has promises for you? Do you believe that you've been called at a time like this to affect the kingdom of God? You know, Eva and I were talking to our kids uh, last night and saying, you know, talking about death and all that stuff, and it's like, when you are born, it wasn't like God, you were born and then God gave you an assignment. No. There was an assignment for you. And then God created you for you to fulfill that assignment. But I think sometimes we forget that. We think that we are just going around or we are just going on through our life like just another day. But we don't think about you have an assignment no matter where you are. And that's why God says he, he, honors, he is going to use the weak to, to, to fool the, the strong because the strong think they got forever. But if you humble yourself before God and allow him to walk through you, then you can accomplish what God has called you. My fourth and last point is this. Do you believe? See, we have all these ideas in our mind how God is going to do stuff. But tonight I'm asking you to dismiss your ideas completely. Dismiss them and let God do what he does best. Fight for you. Overcome for you. Bless you, caution you, tell you even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. You know, my rod comforts you. Psalms 23. And you think about it, it's your walking through it. Because we've been, we've been likened to be sheep. He's our shepherd. He knows where to go. He knows where we shouldn't go. He uses his rod to, to beat up anything that tries to attack us. But we've got to be submissive to him. We gotta allow him to work through us. See, God's response is not small. God's response is not small. Think about it. Forty plus assassins want to kill Paul. Forty of them. That's a lot of people wants to kill you. Trained people who are gonna kill you, right? How does God respond? Let me read it so I don't get it wrong. He responds with 200 soldiers, 
200 spearmen and 70 horse, horsemen. 470 army, that is the response that God brings for Paul. I don't have 470 dudes waiting to save me anytime. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, it would be nice. <laughs> Maybe seven, right? <laughs> but that's why I ask you tonight, in a humble way, you need to dismiss your ideas. Because there is no way you'd have thought that 40 guys, 40 assassins, the response was going to be 470 dudes right. armed. And this is the cool part too. Paul, who was a prisoner, beaten, and, and he didn't even know where his fate was. He was, there were 70 guys on the horse, and the 70, 71 guy was Paul. Because the commander said, get, a, get an animal so he can mount. Paul rode a horse to go to the palace. He's a prisoner who was being beaten by people. The next minute, there's 400 dudes marching alongside him for his protection. 400 dudes. There's 70 others on the horse, and he is on a horse and just being led. That's what our God can do. Amen. If there was a time you'd be excited tonight, that would be the moment, right? Because I know the battle doesn't belong to me. But most of the time I want to fight and I want to try to tell God how he's supposed to fight. But God says, let me tell you, okay, when you're done planning your own thing, then I can show you that I am God. 470 guys defending Paul. Not that 200 wouldn't have done it, right? (laughs) But he's God. And when he defends you, when he defends you, he defends you big. A child of God is protected by God. A child of God who does the will of God will inherit the promises God has given us. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And this was Moses. The the children of Israel, they have come to that point where they they are about to go to the promised land. And they're scared. But he says, be strong and courageous. I'll tell you that tonight. That be strong and courageous because the God who's brought you to this point, he will continue to carry you even tomorrow, the day after, however long you have here. See, when God has set something, when God has set something in motion, there is nothing that can stop it. We have to trust God's timing. God's moment is not going to be sooner or later. His promises will come to be regardless of what happens. His plans will be always there. Let us trust God to fight for us. The battle belongs to God. It belongs to him. And he's going to fight, uh, fight until the end. See, that's the, important, the, the most interesting thing is when we let God defend us, when we let God defend us, he actually let other defend us. Yeah. We read here, um, the commander wrote a letter saying, Acts 23, 29, I found out that he was, accused, uh, uh, he was accused concerning questions of their law, but has nothing charged against him uh, deserving of death or chain. Think about that. The commander is the one who's writing a letter defending Paul. The same people that have imprisoned Paul are the same people that are writing a letter because God made him defend them. But yet we want to try to do this. God is like, let me show off on 470. But even on top of that, I might have the commander dude write a letter saying that, dude, you're not supposed to die. There's nothing wrong with you. But yet we want to fight. Do you believe that God can fight for you? If you didn't until now, you should. Do you believe that God can fight for you? Oh, I love that. That's good. Psalms 91, 14, 14, 14, 16 says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
that I love that verse because, because he has set his love upon me. Because you love God. Because Paul loved God. Because there's nothing else. There's nothing else. It's just you, Christ. And because of that, God sees and says, I will deliver you and set you high. He doesn't try to elevate himself. God elevates him because he has known my name. Yeah. Do you know God's name tonight? Yeah. See, to end this story, the interesting part is the commander kept, uh, this is a commentary, and says the commander kept Paul in Herod's judge, uh, judgment hall or palace. This was a place Herod had built. It was magnificent. There was buildings given a large account. There were famous ports and there, were, there was amphitheater. There was theaters. There was everything that you'd wanted. Here he was kept guard by a soldier, but he was not in confinement. He was at liberty and his friends and acquaintances had to leave and come and see him. Think about that. God protected Paul from a point he was going to be killed. He brings this little boy that just frustrated the plans. He offers 470 soldiers to take him where he wants. He goes, he gets a letter that says, this is my child. No one can touch him. And then he provides a place, a palace, where his friends would come in and hang out. That's the God we serve. Do you believe that he can protect you? Yes. Do you believe that he can protect you? If you do, let's stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you tonight, God. I thank you, Father, for reminding us, God, that, Lord, you truly are fighting for us, God. But Jehovah God, there's so many times, God, that we want to fight, Lord, that we want to, to throw jabs back. There are, there are times when we get hurt, Lord, and we, we want to take it in our, own, in our own, God. But you're saying, move out of the way. You are my child. Let me protect you. I thank you, God, for showing us what you did for Paul, God. That Jehovah God, you didn't have to go to that extent, Lord. But Father, because you wanted to let people feed them victory, not today, Lord. That Jehovah God, this is who you are, Lord. That you take your children seriously, God, those who commit and dedicate their hearts to you, God. Father, let this message never leave us, oh God. No matter how crazy the world is out there, Father, no matter the attacks, no matter what goes on, King of glory, God, we thank you, God, that we have you on our side, oh Lord. God, I pray, Father, for that individual out there, God, that, that thinking that they are alone, that they are weak, oh King of glory, God. That Jehovah God, you can fight for them, Lord. And I want to ask you, God, to speak, them to, to speak to their hearts tonight, oh God. And confirm, Lord, that you died for them, oh God. I pray, Jehovah God, for those people that don't know you, God, that you may get them to know you, Lord. I pray, Jehovah God, Father, that we may believe, God. Let us come out of this place this week, this year, God. Walking in faith, knowing, the Lord, that we believe you, Father. We believe the things you say. We believe your promises, O oh God. We believe that you are Lord over all, King of glory, God. Lord, we praise you and we honor you. Be with us, O oh God, as we live, O oh God. Jehovah God, we, do, we pray a covering over this word that the enemy does not steal it in the name of Jesus, Father. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.